Well, welcome to you all. Welcome to Representing the Rust Belt, covering working class voters in Wisconsin. Joining me this evening for this conversation, Melody McCurtis, Deputy Director of Priorities and an organizer for Metcalf Park Community Bridges. Kathleen Bartson Culver, she holds the James Burgess Chair in Journalism Ethics and is the Director of the University of Wisconsin-Madison's Center for Journalism Ethics. And Dan Kaufman, author of The Fall of Wisconsin and a reporter for The New Yorker. Welcome panelists, it's great to have you here. This conversation this evening is sponsored in part by the University of Wisconsin's Center for Journalism Ethics and by the Economic Hardship Reporting Project. The aim of the Economic Hardship Reporting Project is to change the national conversation around poverty and economic security. The journalism that's commissioned by the project from narrative features and photo on instability. Is it the project? See some of the great content at economichardship.org. So how do you cover the working class vote in an authentic, non-condescending and meaningful way? Meaningful so that communities with a lot in common see their issues explained in a way that reflects the reality of their lives and meaningful so that other communities see an accurate portrayal, one that's not paternalistic, one that's not sensationalist. Our panel this evening will discuss those topics and electoral trends and voter enfranchisement in what's shaping up to be a critical swing state. Melania Trump and Karen Pence, Vice President Mike Pence and Joe Biden have all been to Wisconsin this week or are about to arrive. And later on in the program, we'll be taking your questions put to our panel. Please use the Q&A function down at the bottom and put your questions in there and I'll get to them when we can. Melody McCurtis, let me start with you. Let me get a, a view on the ground from Wisconsin itself. Um, is early voting underway? What do the lines look like? What do the crowds look like? Uh, is it better than what the rest of the nation saw on primary day when Wisconsin went ahead with a primary just in the first blush of the pandemic and an enormous number of Milwaukee polling place, places were reduced to just five and it took hours and hours to vote in most of the city. Tell us what's going on now. Well, thank you, Ray. So, you know, here we are now um, for the presidential uh, uh, election right now and early voting did start October 20th. Um, and, and one of the major differences is, is that we have 14 um, polling locations that folks can go in and vote early, um, starting October 20th, all the way to November 1st. Now, um, as far as on the ground, uh, something that Metcalf Park Community Bridges did is we threw a, a collective early vote caravan on October 20th, really engaging folks to go and vote early together. Um, and because of COVID, right, and the, and the, and the number of uh, new COVID cases, um, it still was a, a long time to vote. It took, it took a while. I think I was the last person to vote out of a 40 plus caravan and there was other people there. So there still was long lines. It was not the size that we saw in the April election, but it was still a long line because you have to, you know, really be distant. They really marked the sidewalk really good, um, which we didn't see in April to make sure folks are, uh, far apart, we were providing PPE uh, kits that had gloves and masks and hand sanitizers and pins inside of those. So if we saw people that didn't have a mask, we were able to give them masks so folks could uh, keep their self protected and keep other folks protected. Um, but it is a process. It's a long process because of, you know, the pandemic that we are in. But um, 14 polling locations compared to five um, is a difference. And then they do have uh, drop off boxes at some of these early voting sites. So if folks did um, absentee ballots and they don't want to send it through the mail, they can drop it off at those locations 
and they do empty those uh, drop off boxes every day. So well, I mean, like right four, 14 polling places is not exactly it's better than five, as you point yeah. out. But Milwaukee is a city of over 600,000 people. 14 right. polling locations is not a lot. It's also big. It's not a lot. And it's very cold now. So imagine being in line. I was there for two hours. Um, and in that whole hour, I'm outside of the the location um, for that whole first hour. So we need more than that, right? For the size of the city that we have, right? Everything that's going on with the mail system, um, people can't register online anymore. So they have to come in and be able to register at an early voting site or during election day. So it's, it's really causing people to have to go out and, and still risk it, right? It's still a risk. It's a major risk to go out right now. Professor, uh, when you talk about journalism ethics, is it not just the practices, the folk ways, the techniques, but recognizing that there's kind of a moral dimension to the work reporters do? Who gets covered? Who does the covering? Uh, depiction, portrayal uh, versus exploitation and a kind of poverty porn. I think the phrase poverty porn is so powerful because it speaks to the moral dimensions of what we're doing here and the power of journalism to either focus us on an individual and their personal plight or the social structures um, that, that put all of us in these positions. You know, journalism does not have a terrific track record in reporting on this. Um, it, that's not to say it's it's all bad. Um, I think we have made progress, but we look have to look at things like framing, whether we're doing... Um, you know, individual pull your pull yourself up by the bootstraps frames or frames that talk to social structures. So we have work to be done. And part of that work is who gets represented in newsrooms, to be honest. You know, if we look at things like race and age, education, household income, we definitely have work to be done with the perspectives that we have within newsrooms. You know, Dan, it's human nature to want to read, watch, listen to stories about people like yourself, especially in local coverage. But do news directors, do assignment editors, decision makers in news organizations not really want to cover, for example, communities in deep poverty because those are not the same people who are the target audience for the product they're selling, whether it's television news, a local newspaper, uh, radio journalism, is the fact that communities of deep poverty are not perceived as their audience um, bound to make the coverage we do of working class communities flawed from the start? Um, I think that there's some truth to that, Ray. I, um, I do think that there was, you saw some of that in the 2016 election, this, uh, in the coverage of issues like free trade, where in a lot of powerful East Coast media, it's, it's um, the grievances around that issue are uh, kind of papered over and they're not taken seriously, the loss of these jobs, which are deeply remembered. And um, it's like, it's almost like a half-life. These jobs have uh, the, you know, the loss of uh, a stable income that one's father, one's mother, one's uncle had, that security is um, more profound and doesn't get picked up in things like the unemployment statistics because the jobs that are being replaced are not the same kinds of jobs that were being lost. So I think that was a really, um, that's been going on for a long time, but I think you saw how that, um, that lack of the media's focus uh, in 2016 really um, was missed. I mean, for, and for, for a long time, the parties uh, have shifted away a lot from um, both parties, from these kinds of concerns. And uh, Donald Trump seized on this alienation and anger. Um, in Wisconsin, he didn't actually do particularly well. It's kind of overplayed that he won the state. He won the state with fewer voters than Mitt Romney received. But uh, of course, Hillary Clinton did a lot worse. And there was voter disenfranchisement, voter suppression. Um, and, but there was also disaffection of uh, voters that felt, uh, and you've seen voting participation rates decline 
over the generations. And I think that reflects um, that these kinds of issues aren't being covered. And also, um, and, and I think the major parties reflect a lot. This, it's kind of circular thing with the media and they're reflecting the media's interests, which are not about closed plants in Youngstown or uh, what was happening in Flint, for example, for a long time before it burst into this crisis. But you've seen a real deep erosion of the public infrastructure for decades. Um, no public investment to speak of. And there's a lot of anger around that and how that anger got manifest was different for different groups of people. Um, but it was, uh, it was a, a cry of anger and I think it was reflective of being ignored for a long time, so. Melody, if you get a call from a reporter or your organization does, is the reaction, oh great, finally some much needed attention to what we're doing over here or is the reaction more like, oh no, here we go again? You know, even now, I don't really get a lot of calls to cover the work that we're doing around civic engagement from media. The calls that I get is saying, hey, we wanna cover the, your mutual aid efforts or you know, this the happy story, right? They don't really wanna go deep and uncover what, what we're up against on the ground. Um, even with this film being out and people seeing this film and really getting to, to understand all of the different things that we have to do uh, to, to re-engage our folks and, and um, restore, you know, all of those things that have been against them, right? The disenfranchisement, the distrust, the what are they doing for us, you know? So change and all of that. So even to this day now, I'm not getting calls like that from media. Um, if I sent the request out to come cover the caravan, they're not coming out. They're not responding. Um, for the caravan, lucky enough, uh, Spectrum News came out just randomly, and, and that was great. So in some aspects, it's changing a little bit, but they still wanted to pitch it as this happy thing that we're doing and not really uncovering what we have, what we're going through to get to you know, a caravan, right? Um, and why we're doing a caravan. So that's what I'm saying on the ground. And it's, it's always been like that. Um, my organization has been doing this work since 2012. Uh, residents created their plan. One of the things that they said was a priority for them is civic engagement in 2012. And they said that, you know, civic engagement is power, voting is power, showing up to these meetings and holding officials accountable is power. So they, they been knew that it was power. We've, we've been working on this, but uh, we haven't even got any of this intention until this year. And we had to hit the ground running doing all of this other work um, before we could even talk to people about voting. We had to make sure they had the things that they needed, right? Um, and now what we're seeing this year is that a lot of folks are reaching out about this, this happy story and not, it's a lot of trials and tribulations that we have to go through to get our folks to the polls, to get them access, to make sure they feel safe, make sure they have the tools that they need in order to, um, cast their ballot and not be, uh, in a, in a huge risk like they were on April 7th. You heard Melody mention a film. We're going to show it to you in just a moment. If you've just joined us in the last few minutes, this is Representing the Rust Belt, covering working class voters in Wisconsin. Melody McCurtis is with uh, Metcalf Park Community Bridges. The Economic Hardship Reporting Project helped get a film produced showing the work of her, her organization in Metcalf Park. Let's take a look at that film now. And we need audio on that film. Maybe you can start it from the beginning. Uh, 
Ah, the perils of live Zooming. (laughs) We will bring you that film in just a moment. Uh, Until we are ready to show it, maybe, uh, Melody, I can ask you, uh, what do people who do come and cover Metcalf Park uh, get wrong or get right uh, when they try to bring it to the wider coverage area? You know, a, a television station in Milwaukee has a coverage from like nine or 10 counties, stretches all the way into Northern Illinois. Um, what are people seeing? Are they seeing an accurate and fair representation of life in your neighborhood? <laughs> I don't think that they're seeing a, a, a fully accurate or, or fair representation. I think uh, one of the things that I have been seeing um, is that they have been showing that folks are activated, right? Folks are doing the work, organizations like, like my organizations and other organizations in the city. So this, you know, this election um, compared to 2016, I remember I didn't see a, a poster about voting anywhere in my neighborhood. I didn't see an official knocking on my door. And I think now what they have been covering is that, you know, people are doing these voting drives or um, if you need help registering to vote, you can, you can reach out to these folks. So that's something that they're doing that has been helpful, um, you know, which is great. But I think that it's, 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 it's powerful and it's important for communities like mine and communities in Milwaukee to understand how we got here, right? And the severity of, even when you do all of those steps, you still might have to go through more steps. So for me personally, um, as an organizer, as an activist, as somebody that does this work for the April election, I requested my ballot March 23rd. I didn't find out I was, wasn't getting my ballot until I saw a news article saying, hey, if you requested about it on the 22nd or the 23rd, it's not coming, right? Um, Nobody reached out to me to tell me that my ballot wasn't coming. And we did all of this work to register over 500 folks, new voters, new voters, right? Um, And walk them through how to request an absentee ballot. And some of those folks sent the ballot in and it, and it, it didn't get counted. Some folks, their ballot came the next day after elections. Um, so that was a hard blow. And I feel like, you know, that should have been everywhere. You know, that should have been on every news outlet that that, that happened. I accidentally saw that article, right? Um, it wasn't blown up everywhere. Um, and I think that that should have been dived in a little bit deeper because we had another election in August, right? Um, this is an election year. Uh, here in in Milwaukee and in Wisconsin. Dan Kaufman, uh, I'm wondering whether journalism writ large, capital J, in America, is trying to cover a a queen-size bed with a twin-size sheet. There are fewer reporters. Newsrooms have uh, shrunk. Their budgets have shrunk. This is a story that's happening in a lot of places, in a lot of counties, in a lot of states, covering ballot access is a pretty daunting thing, even if you mean well, even if you want to cover it well. It's not that easy, is it? No, I don't think it is, Ray. And I think you're right. I think um, one of the big problems that isn't spoken about enough is the consolidation of of media and how, particularly in Wisconsin, you've seen, um, you know, report newspapers from Green Bay or Janesville that used to have uh, a state house reporter full time; those those people are gone, and so um, that coverage is being supplanted by talk radio and other forms, and some good internet journalism, but nothing with the kind of broad reach. And I think this consolidation of media has caused an erosion of democracy all over the country. You've seen it in Wisconsin very acutely in the past decade. Um, the there was just a massive sea change in the state's politics uh, with the Tea Party wave that elected Governor Scott Walker. And there was incredible transformation of the state. It's, um, it's kind of political DNA was, uh, it was essentially turned into a kind of conservative laboratory. And you had things like 
uh, voter ID laws. I mean, it had been a state that historically uh, was very encouraging of citizen participation and lowercase d democratic involvement. That really changed. And I don't think, um, no fault, there were some excellent reporters in the state, but as you say, they were uh, over, over stretched and outmatched by the scale of the changes. And then you have a, a very vibrant, very partisan conservative media that's flooding the airwaves. There was a study uh, at the UW uh, Journalism School that showed that there's uh, about 190 hours of um, right conservative talk radio on every week and every and it's on in every single media market in the state. So you're getting, uh, you know, and then social media and so on. That was very important in the 2016 election. Um, but yeah, these kind of really important issues that are hard to cover. Um, I think a lot of times news organizations focus on, you know, big picture Washington power politics or else these kind of feel good narratives or else the kind of, you know, quintessential cliche diner story when they talk about working class voters and the complexity of these uh, groups of people is really lost and their voices are lost because they're being, um, you know, a microphone is shoved in somebody's face. There's no, you know, the reporter doesn't have time to develop these kinds of intimacy and the editors a lot of times want this kind of very simplistic, almost caricature of a Rust Belt voter or something like that, or a voting rights struggle. It's, it's very um, cursory often. I mean, there's some wonderful people doing wonderful things always, but um, it's also, it's kind of both too much and too little at the same time, if you know what I mean. There's a flood of reporting on the internet, but it's, some of it is excellent and some of it is, is, uh, does not have the rigor of some of the old school journalism that people had uh, before and where these, um, and I think that's permitted some kinds of radical changes to a place like Wisconsin. It's, it's at least facilitated that. So. Yeah, it's a good point about internet journalism because not only is the quality uneven, there's an exciting uh, yeasty, uh, expanding, exploding world of citizen journalism on the internet, which is terrific, democratizing, but at the same time, very few of those outlets speak to audiences the size of that commanded by, you know, the Milwaukee Journal, uh, commanded by uh, the state public radio network, the Wisconsin radio network. So. Uh, the convening power of those legacy institutions is still there. And if you want to talk to a lot of people, you want to get on one of those places for all the, the wonderful in, and inventive and um, forward-looking great new citizen journalism that's being done uh, online. Uh, Kathleen, that might be a cue for you since you, you work at a journalism school. Uh, the sort of state of the business and whether it's even equipped to cover a diverse, complicated, challenging social landscape like the one offered by Wisconsin. It's an excellent question, Ray. Um, you know, we cannot deny the loss of the labor force here in Wisconsin and, and anywhere in the United States when it comes to local news. Um, you know, we've shed thousands uh, of jobs over the last 10, 15 years specifically. Um, this dramatically affects rural Wisconsin. Um, you know, we have news deserts, um, whole counties that have maybe one um, legacy news outlet that's trying to, you know, do things neutrally, in some cases only a weekly. Um, we do have research that shows us that those news deserts, the loss of local news, um, can increase polarization. When we don't have a shared outlet of vetted, verified information, uh, we pull apart from each other. And I think that there's a real danger in that. Uh, now, there are some positive aspects. I don't want to be all Debbie Downer here. Um, the Wisconsin Center for Investigative Journalism is one of the country's best nonprofit news outlets. Um, you know, they they share their reporting for free um, with any news outlet in well, in the state, but also in the country. And to me, that's the real public service journalism model that I think that we should all um, pay attention to. I, I want to go back to something that um, you said earlier that you asked of uh, of Dan, and that is, you know, 
what's the role that money is playing in all of this? Um, you know, I get very troubled when I hear um, news outlets talking about serving their audience. Um, I think we need to come at this from the perspective of serving citizens. So if I am not a subscriber of the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, um, but my vote is being suppressed in Milwaukee, they need to be reporting on that because uh, journalism owes an obligation to citizens, not just to the people who pay for news. Now, that said, I, hope, I wish we'd all pay a little bit more for news. Um, so I, I do think that in some ways we are doing a good job of making that twin size sheet fit across the queen size bed, but we all have to double down on, uh, on that service to citizens and representing all of them in our coverage. Well, in an earlier conversation, uh, Kathleen Bartson Culver um, was talking about the problems with um, broadband, high-speed internet service across the state of Wisconsin. And um, we're seeing that uh, in action this evening. We have some difficulty with her connection, but it's an illustration of how access to broadband uh, has become not just a fun thing that allows you to um, play games or screen movies, but really uh, an important tool of engagement and an important tool of information that allows you to be a participant in, that allows you to tap into uh, the information essential to doing the work of being a citizen. Why don't we try again uh, to take a look at the film produced in cooperation with the Economic Hardship Reporting Project about Melody McCurtis's community. How you doing? All right, we're just dropping off some more food and some other household items. We got information about voting and census in there that's super important. Give us a call. My name is Melody McCurtis. I am the deputy director at Metcalf Park Community Bridges. Oh, we call this the free little grocery store. Mm -hmm. That's not stable. When COVID first happened, our families in Metcalf Park didn't have food. They didn't have hygiene products. They didn't have cleaning supplies. The city, the county, the state, they didn't do anything for our families. You know, Metcalf Park Community Bridges had to create a whole system to make sure our people had what they need. Our communities, they said that they're not online, right? So all of these messages that was online, our community wasn't getting that information. That's when we got... Jordan on board, and she's like, hey, we're going to make these resource guys, we're going to bring digital to them. Hey, how you doing? Make sure you look at that packet of some information about voting census in there, and call us if you need some additional support. Hey, Ms. Ophelar, how you doing? You looking good. That pink is popping. What's up, Toya? I would have hired Melody regardless of who she was because she loves my people. She cares about them. She happens to be my daughter. And we get an idea, a, a flavor of the kind of unseen reporting that could be done. Uh, not just sympathetic, not just intimate and personal, but also accurate. Uh, you know, it has, it has the advantage of being closely observed community life uh, that is quite different from only running over to a part of town uh, when you can put your uh, lights on on your camera and take pictures of men with their hands on the hood of a car or uh, police tape uh, taping off a crime scene uh, blowing in the winter wind. There is a lot more to be said about communities that are under a tremendous amount of stress in than to just illustrate um, the, the crime, the downsides of, of life in those places. Melody, in the course of that film, you said, I don't really make a lot of money, but we're building the world we want to see. And I I 
got the sense that that's really what you wanted to show people in this film. You know, absolutely. Um, my community's well built, well being is wealth. Um, people that look like me having everything that they need is wealth, um, and that's that's more important than my individual wealth. If 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 that makes sense. Uh, and that work, uh, as you mentioned, may not pay very well. Uh, does it pay a dividend when you see a long line of people waiting to vote? When you uh, see uh, somebody who's changed their mind about uh, voting? You know, we, later in the movie, we see you uh, working door to door and somebody basically telling you they're not interested because they don't really believe their vote counts. And it was actually very heartening uh, to see you try to sell them on the idea of, you know, basic civic engagement. You know, don't be cynical. Don't be discouraged. Don't think that you don't count. You were pushing back against that, um, you know, in some ways understandable conclusion that people in your neighborhood might have that they've been forgotten by the rest of the world. I mean, and that's a real conclusion to have when you live in communities like mine, when you when you do all of the steps and your ballot doesn't come and you have to go and stand in the line. Those are those are real things. When you're a felon and you're no longer on papers and your parole officer doesn't tell you that you can vote again. I mean, these are, this is what's coming up in my community. So um, and, it, and it takes time. Everybody is not going to be like, oh, I'm going to go vote because Melody and Danielle came to my door. It might, it might be just calling that person up and saying, hey, are you okay? You know, we're in a pandemic. Is there anything that we can do? Um, and building that relationship out. And, and that person in the film, I won't say her, say her name, but I've watched her grow up. She grew up with my little brother and, and now she's an adult um, and she's voted before and we talked to her. So she's going to vote, not because she believes in it, but, you know, really understanding that her vote affects the whole community. Um, so she's she's gonna vote, but some people, they're not gonna do it because they don't see the benefits of it, right? And I think in the film, one of the things I said is voting is just a stepping stone, it's a piece, it's not the all be all. Um, once we elect folks in, we have uh, the right to ensure that what they said they were gonna do and what the, the things that we are asking for happens, right? Um, and we can do that by advocacy and holding folks accountable and showing up to these meetings when they're making those decisions and and really, you know, building that relationship with these officials once they get in. Um, and and it's and it's it's hard work, but it's it's rewarding at the same time. If you want to watch the rest of the film, you could do it at the Intercepts website, and I I really urge you to do that. It is worth seeing the. Uh, the balance of the production. Uh, Dan Kaufman, you speak to readers, probably some of the most affluent readers in the country, judging by the ads that run in the New Yorker uh, for Van Cleef and Arpels and, uh, and diamond uh, jewelry and, uh, and exotic vacations. Why is it important to get working class communities right for your readers? Well, I, I write for a lot of different it's true, I, I write for The New Yorker a lot, and I think that the magazine has always had an interest in, um, you know, it had some legendary uh, reportage going back decades around all kinds of um, unnoticed topics, the environmental movement and so on and so forth. Um, but I think it's really important. Um, obviously, the 2016 election kind of focused people's minds. I personally grew up in Wisconsin, and I've always had a sort of, um, you know, mild chip on my shoulder around the uh, dismissal of the industrial Midwest and um, these the, the issues that have been plaguing people for decades there. Again, I go back to the trade issue, this enormous um, erosion of wealth. I mean, southeastern Wisconsin has an industrial density that rivals Germany, but you've seen a tremendous migration of good paying jobs um, to low wage countries. And that effect 
has had a profound uh, change on politics, not just in Wisconsin, in Michigan, in Ohio, in Pennsylvania, in all kinds of places. And I think um, I feel a kind of um, passion and calling to, to elevating these stories, which are so, uh, so frequently overlooked. I spent two months in back and forth with, in Youngstown, Ohio, covering the closing of a GM plant, which was kind of the last large employer in an area of Northeastern Ohio that once boasted of 50,000 steel jobs. And again, I would bring it back to the point of this loss of wealth for working class communities, not to romanticize it, but there was um, a period um, for a, a, quite some decades where there was a reasonable amount of stability um, through good paying manufacturing jobs. Um, and those have vanished, um, not completely, but to an astonishing degree. And you're seeing all kinds of social costs to that um, increase in deaths of despair across all, all racial classes. In fact, the United States uh, life expectancy is declining for the first time in a century. Um, and that is largely because of premature deaths in working age adults. Um, and it's a terrible tragedy. And I feel, um, for me personally, I find it much more interesting to talk to a steel worker, not just about whether they're being laid off or not, but about what they do. And I was always very impacted by Studs Terkel's famous book, Working, and that kind of oral tradition and kind of the focus that we've lost so much in the country about work and what people do for work um, or what they don't do for work. Um, but I find it really fascinating um, and uh, much more un, you know, I think for journalists, a lot of times it's so much more interesting to go into a story that no one else is covering. I wouldn't know how to cover a Biden campaign event, but I feel like I could do a reasonably good job on a steel plant closing. Um, and I just, I just feel like there's a lot of wisdom and a lot of intelligence and ingenuity and um, determination um, and complexity in, in these communities. And whether it's just an industrial community or I, my, a recent article I wrote was about the um, consolidation of dairy farms in Wisconsin and, and it followed uh, a woman who's, one of the protagonists was a woman whose husband committed suicide after they lost their cows. And I think there's just, to me, I would rather, I feel a kind of moral calling around doing that kind of work. But I also think it's just frankly more interesting than reading about the machinations. I'm not saying that it's not important about the Trump White House or this or that. Because I, I think that the story that's often lost is how politics affects people's lives. And I think that is such an important topic that is still so underexplored. We get involved in these 30,000 foot views about politics, but uh, like for example, what Melody is doing, far more interesting, I think also to readers. And I think a lot of times um, editors and so on sell their readers short that they don't necessarily want that kind of story when actually I think they really do. And I think they can relate to these people. That piece about farmers was, um, you know, the most, uh, I'm not boasting or anything. It was just the most widely circulated piece on the New Yorker site. So I think there's an interest in these kinds of stories that's underappreciated. Um, so that, I guess that's what I would say, say about that question, Ray. I would recommend that you go to the New Yorker website and read Dan's reporting from Wisconsin's Dairyland, especially because Wisconsin has become such a critical part of this year's election and the polls are still tied. And obviously the candidates think it's a, and the campaigns think it's a critical part of this election because you can tell by their travels and where they're going uh, that they are really worried uh, both in GOP and democratic circles about where Wisconsin's going. You know, when Dan mentions that the uh, concentration of industrial might was similar to, to that of parts of West Germany, uh, you may not even realize that you were 
uh, touching Wisconsin product because when you buy um, paper for your copy machine, uh, the paper wouldn't say Wisconsin on it, but it might've been made on a machine that was made in Beloit, Wisconsin. That's not something that a customer buys in a store, a paper making machine made in Beloit, but Beloit um, supported itself with making that heavy machinery that went to places like paper mills in Alabama and Quebec and upstate New York. Uh, you may not realize it because the lawnmower uh, had another name on it. It was made by another maker, but it might've had a Briggs and Stratton motor in it, uh, which was made in Southeastern Wisconsin. Uh, one product that you would recognize is, uh, is a Harley Davidson motorcycle, uh, which famously comes from Southeast Wisconsin. And uh, for a long time, American Motors and then Chrysler, uh, Jeep, Eagle, and that product line as it uh, migrated from the old American Motors to the Iacocca era uh, Chrysler, uh, there was a big plant in Southeast Wisconsin uh, that made those vehicles as well. And when that plant closed and when um, Briggs and Stratton offshored a lot of its work, making components and, and making many of the smaller engines themselves. Uh, when Harley Davidson uh, ran afoul of, um, of various uh, uh, tariffs during the Trump era trade wars, this is, yeah, uh, sure, it's something that turns up in the business pages, but it also turns up in lost overtime, uh, cuts in the second shift, and, uh, you know, people suddenly having a lot less work to do in a very concentrated place in one town or in one string of towns. And that brings down the, the income, brings down the security, uh, means that suddenly a, a Catholic school tuition may not be able to be paid, um, payments uh, toward saving up for a new family car can't be made. The small uh, retreats, the small defeats that, uh, that make up a lot of industrial workers' lives in recent years um, don't get seen when you look at it at 30,000 feet and report on the share price of Harley-Davidson as a way in to, to telling that kind of story. And certainly Milwaukee, Melody McCurtis, is a place with a lot of uh, vacant lots and factor factories that aren't factories anymore and, and on and on and on. Yeah, Rand, just to add to that, and what you were saying, Dad, I don't think people understand how politics play a key key role in that, right? Um, when they are negotiating, which companies can come, and then when they leave, how how are these buildings left? You know, how are they kept up? Are they just in the middle of a neighborhood and they're, they're just eyesores and nobody's working in them? That's what we're dealing with. Um, and, and in the film, you know, I touched on the fact of, what kind of jobs are our officials negotiating coming to communities like Metcalf Park, right? Are they $8 an hour jobs, $7, $7.25 jobs, or are they really family supporting jobs? And we are not seeing that. Um, and we haven't seen that since the 90s and the 80s when these factories really uh, held families together for a few generations, right? For a few for a few decades, and we don't see that anymore, right? So, even really diving in on that, I mean, far more interesting, right? And then folks can see how all of these different things tie in together, and how one decision can affect a whole group of people. I want to remind you that uh, we welcome your questions. Uh, just bring your cursor down to the bottom of your Zoom screen. There's a function called Q and A. And you can type your questions in there. And uh, as they come in, I will answer them. Uh, do people in your neighborhood, Melody, have, uh, have a lot of access to the internet, a lot of access to broadband? We're told that black and brown consumers uh, rely heavily on uh, accessing the web through their phones, but then when you get down to the nitty gritty, those plans often cost more than a family can swing. 
Yeah, so one of the first things that we did in March is that we we checked in with our community. Uh, we sent out a survey asking, um, do you have data? Do you have it on your phone? Is it any good? Do you have internet? Um, and what's the best way to reach you? And almost 90% of those folks out of 150 folks said that they didn't have internet and that they relied on their phone and they had prepaid plans. So the, the difference of having a, a, a phone uh, plan, right, versus a prepaid, which is folks in my neighborhood, that's all you can afford is a prepaid phone because it comes with, you get this free phone and then you pay $40 a month to have it. So the data on there is capped. Um, so certain things they're not able to access. So we already knew that that was going to happen and we've been seeing that. And then everything that happened with the schools um, closing with no plan, we knew that our family couldn't even get their kids online because they didn't have access to it. So we still, we're, we're still seeing a digital divide um, and, and data access divide. We're still seeing that here we are all the way almost in November. What does a kid do? I, I don't know if uh, how many of the public schools are open in Milwaukee now, but if your teacher, you know, easily waves a hand and says, okay, you know, we're, we're going to start working from home. Uh, I'll bet a lot of these kids can't get on the web and they can't do their homework and they can't hand it in and they can't see the teacher and on and on. So I have two children that's, that's online and you'll see, see that in the film, a, a five and eight year old. And then I do this kind of work, right. Which is not realistic. I'm failing something, right. I'm definitely failing this virtual learning because parents literally have to be teachers. The amount of things that they're learning in school is not, is not a lot. So even if they're in school from nine to two 30, they're only doing like two activities in my opinion, but still like if you, we have families that have 10 kids and the school only gave them five Chromebooks, right? But everybody's online and they're sharing Chromebooks and work's not getting done or even navigating Zoom, right? Or navigating the Google Classroom. It's so many different layers to this online learning, even if you got the supplies and they didn't give out internet, they just gave out Chromebooks, right? They didn't come with internet. Um, and then trying to talk to folks about trying to get AT&T and Spectrum when they were doing these, these brief specials that folks could get internet for $10, you know? And then thinking about our folks that don't have credit cards, that don't have debit cards, um, you know, that didn't have that and, and still don't have it and can't get those kind of plans because they require that. So it's all of these different uh, layers and people that aren't impacted or know somebody that's impacted, they don't know all of these ins and outs. And they're not trying to talk to people that know these ins and outs. They're just making decisions. Well, in a lot of places in the country now, you have kids standing outside of stores to do their homeworks, the stores that have uh, free Wi-Fi, uh, standing outside of, uh, of public libraries that are often closed, uh, trying to get onto their uh, internet connection. Brad asks, Wisconsin and Milwaukee are so segregated and split politically. Why do you think white working class voters in outlying suburbs and rural areas support GOP candidates despite policies that do not help them. And on the flip side, why might black working class citizens stay home instead of voting? So I'll put that uh, to both of you. First part to Dan Kaufman. Um, well, I, I think in some ways the, the, um, the flipping has been somewhat exaggerated of the white working class. It definitely was there. Um, you've seen this go on since Reagan's time, uh, the Reagan Democrats, uh, there was a cleavage in labor. I think it reflects a lot of things. Certainly racism is one, but I think um, it also, what's ignored is um, the economic insecurity that emerged. I mean, uh, wages peaked for working class people in 1973, real wages. And there's been a steady erosion even before the advent of NAFTA and these other free trade agreements so I think there was an opening there. There's been cleavages in, in labor, uh, starting with Richard Nixon and the hard hat uh, riots. Um, and Reagan kind of really exacerbated that. You saw a version of that 
in Wisconsin uh, play out really fiercely when Scott Walker attacked the public sector unions and pitted sort of the private sector unions, particularly the building trades um, who had donated some to the GOP um, against the public sector employees, which were mainly teachers, but also corrections officers and other uh, state workers. Um, Walker famously used the term divide and conquer, that he would, um, that he was going to pit the private and public sector workers against each other. And of course, he famously passed a so-called right to work law a couple of years after he passed uh, the um, rescinding collective bargaining rights for public workers. So you've had this steady erosion of labor, which I think is a huge part of it because the labor movement, um, not only was it about getting out the vote, but it was a kind of counterweight to a lot of kind of toxic sentiments in American political life. I mean, you've seen the uh, allegiance of the UAW to the civil rights movement, very important Walter Ruther's connection to Martin Luther King. Um, and I think it, it brings much more than just, it, it, it is a kind of civic pillar that's been decimated, uh, partly through these free trade deals, partly through uh, automation, of course, but also um, through a realignment of national politics away from working class voters as money became more pronounced going back to the 1978 decision, Buckley versus Vallejo and then Citizens United, the parties are swamped with money and the kinds of voices that um, were affected by these free trade deals, for example, were not heard um, and you've had a wiping out. And I think you get, a, you get a very atomized electorate. And some people responded to Trump's xenophobia and racism. Others stayed home, as you mentioned. And I think a lot of African-American working class voters just simply didn't vote. Some of it was uh, because of voter suppression and some of it was because um, they weren't inspired by the, um, the opposition. Um, so I think it's, it's very complicated, like everything and there's not a single one reason, but I think all of those things, you know, play a part in it. Melody, the second part of Brad's question, why might black working class citizens stay home instead of voting? They certainly did in 2016 when the black in Wisconsin was much lower than it was in 2012. Yeah, so to go base, you know, Everything Dan just said, I think it's more complicated than that. And I think that um, media really framed it like that, that Black folks stay home and they didn't vote. Um, when we know that it's voter suppression, when we know that people just said, I'm not going to be a part of that. When we, when we watch this film and see all of the different hoops that folks have to go through in order to cast their ballot, especially Black and Brown folks. Um, so I, I just want to dispel that. I want to name that. And um, in this well, let me stop you right there, because would you say that rather than staying home, they went to polling places and their name wasn't there or they tried to cast a vote and their vote wasn't counted or they uh, made a provisional ballot, which ended up being you know, tossed out? Were there actually large numbers of attempts to vote that ended up not resulting in a counted vote? I wouldn't be able to say yay, yay or nay to that, but I'm I'm pretty sure. I mean, we're we're seeing it now. Um, this is not a new thing. Voter suppression is not a new thing. Um, folks voting and their ballots not getting counted is not a new thing. I just saw an article came out um, an hour before we got on this call about 23,000 voters didn't their votes didn't get counted in August. So this is something that we deal with in Wisconsin in every election, right? Um, so for 2016, I can't say that all black people just didn't want to vote. Um, and I think that we need to dive deeper into what that really looks like and why the turnout was the way it is. And we're gonna have a lot of different reasons why. It's complicated and expensive to hire lawyers to, uh, to argue your case. Did you end up with a a toolkit, a way that regular people could make sure they were on the rolls and could make sure that their vote wasn't going to get thrown out? So there is a way to, uh, and we learned this during this whole process of, uh, 
of this film is that you can really contact your clerk um, after elections. It takes some time to see if your vote was counted. Um, it doesn't, and anybody can do it. I can look up the whole Metcalf Park and I can see who, who, uh, who wasn't counted. It doesn't really tell you why. And they don't call you and tell you. Um, they don't just pick up the phone and be like, hey, you, you forgot your witness signature. Um, or your witness didn't complete the full address or they, they don't tell you. So you really have to be your own investigator or you have to you know, be an organization like us that's trying to figure all of that out for the folks that, that, that did everything in their power and then they weren't counted. And even the report is, is weird how they report why it wasn't counted. It doesn't specifically tell you why. So, and we're, we're, still, we're still in the thick of it right now. In other words, they're not making it easy. No. Uh, Kathleen, uh, you wanted to talk about uh, these, these topics as well. We've had some trouble with your signal. Uh, what do you make of what you've heard? Uh, I do apologize for the signal problem. I am hoping that this is better. I it is. I came back. Oh, good. I'm so glad. <laughs> and I do apologize for, for that. I don't want to waste anyone's time. I, I want to mention something um, in addition to what Melody just said, and that is what we saw in 2016 with efforts to suppress the vote by mis and disinformation um, on the social web. And I think that's something that we all have to pay attention to. So disproportionately targeting Black and Latin voters in Milwaukee and in Dane County, where Madison is, um, with uh, false advertising on Facebook, trying to get people to believe that their vote doesn't matter and that they, they shouldn't show up because they have no power. Um, you know, Melody has come back a number of times to that idea of power and citizens have power in that vote. We all have to recognize that there are bad actors out there trying to sap that power. And, uh, and we need to do everything we can through efforts like Melody's and through better reporting to let people know that, you know, that's the one thing in this country that we all have equal. We all have one vote. You may have a lot more money than me, but you don't get more votes than me. Um, and so, you know, trying to combat that mis and disinformation and trying to use news media as part of that effort is truly important. Now that we have you and you're sounding so great, let me take take advantage of it and ask you another question. David wants to know if there are any resources for voters offered by your project. Well, yes, there are. That's fantastic. Uh, if you go to ethics.journalism.wisc.edu, you'll see that we are participating um, in a project called the Ethics, excuse me, the Election Integrity Project. And it's, a, it's been a really fascinating um, process that we've gone through. We've created the toolkit for reporters to um, debunk and, and we call it debunk myths and disinformation online. Um, but then also a toolkit for citizens. You know, how do you deal with um, your uncle who is sharing a false story on Facebook? Uh, what do you do when your kid um, thing that's, the, that's convincing them not to vote on TikTok? So, you know, we're trying to um, be the good actors in this space um, and, and trying to combat the bad actors. So uh, using your site again as a resource, uh, can you give us the, um, the address again? Yeah, it's ethics.journalism.wisc.edu. And uh, or also a shorter one is um, go.wisc.edu slash election. Um, and that's, WISC, that's W-I-S-C? Correct. W -I -S -C. Or you can just search, yep, you could even just Google Center for Journalism Ethics Election and you'll get right to it. Um, and I also want to say that as part of the project, um, Howard Hardy, who is a reporter who helped us put together these toolkits, he's been doing a lot of investigative journalism on mis and disinformation. And you can find that in news outlets across the state, but also at Wisconsin Watch. And the techniques are getting better and more insidious and more frightening for trying to um, tell people things that simply aren't true. Uh, it's a real, it's a real problem. And you know, if journalism already didn't have enough problems getting the truth out, now there's a falsehood industry that's almost as big and well-financed as the truth industry uh, is. 
Uh, if you have any uh, questions out there in the audience, uh, please let us know. The window is closing for, for getting them in. And uh, barring that, let me go to, uh, to final comments from Dan, Melody, and Kathleen. What would you like to see uh, in the coverage of the remaining days, and maybe this time even, the aftermath of the election? Uh, we have uh, a season that's shaping up to have huge stories breaking on the Wednesday and Thursday of election week, in addition to just uh, the Tuesday when most people are voting. Dan? I'd love to see just a focus again on what I mentioned earlier, like what have, what is the election? What do the politics of the last four years and frankly, the politics of the last several decades, how have they affected people? And how does that affect their choices? I mean, I've been doing um, a lot of reporting from the industrial Midwest and I'm, I'm working on a piece now around that area. And I, I'm endlessly fascinated that to me, the biggest story, which is how these, what's happening in Washington is affecting people is still largely ignored every four years. Again, they might, people might go talk to voters but these issues don't just, uh, they, they're not um, relegated to something that's happened just in a four year period. There's so much um, nuance and history that goes into it. So I'd like to see that kind of deep, I mean, I'm attracted to, I guess you call it long form journalism, this kind of um, mixing of history and personal narratives that I think can unpack some of these um, things for readers and try to connect a person with a larger force like NAFTA or something and how that, how that affected them. Um, I think even though the election is obviously paramount, it's just a snapshot of our lives. And I think it's important to remember that and that everything that's going into it um, there'll be issues that will continue on November 4th, the same things that fed uh, Biden's victory or Trump's victory. And it's important for people to understand what is driving um, these candidates and what is driving the people that are voting for particular people. Melody, your hopes for the coming week and beyond, really. I, I can't wait till election day. Me neither. <laughs> Everything Dan just said, and for as far as reporting, civic engagement is a is a year round thing, even if it's not an election year. Um, I want to see how politics affect lives, you know, day to day. I want to see that. I want I want to see that um, everywhere, and I want my community to be able to access that, um, so that. <clears throat> Elections is easier, right? And it's not harder. Um, I don't want to see any misinformation. I don't. I don't want to see all of this. Uh, I don't want to have to be a part of a lawsuit trying to get you know basic things in a pandemic to be done, right? Um, that's what I want to see. I can't even think past the third right now. Uh, I can't even. I can't even see it. I can't wait till we get. To the fourth. I'm with you, <laughs> but I think I think uh, the fourth may not be the end of the story. It's not. <laughs> uh, oh. Once again, a reminder of the, the email address for uh, not email address the web address for uh, further resources and information. Go dot wisc dot edu slash election. Uh, your final comments, Kathleen? Yeah, I, I absolutely echo what Dan and Melody have said. Um, and I guess I have sort of two additional Christmas wishes <laughs> we had in. And gosh, I hope this is all done by Christmas. Uh, number one, I, I really hope that journalists will continue to um, reassure citizens that while this is the most unusual year we have ever lived through, um, it, it's a pretty typical election. You know, more people are voting absentee and early. 
Um, but the people who are collecting those ballots, the machines that are reading those ballots, they're, it, they're all the same way we've always done um, things to ensure a free and fair election. So even though we might not have a count on Tuesday, we might not have the AP projecting results, we still have a free and fair election. And I, and I hope my fellow citizens, regardless outcome um, will accept that and not believe these bad actors. The other, uh, the other wish I have is that journalists will look outside the makeups of their own newsrooms um, and, and learn some lessons from 2016 about who they were missing in their storytelling. Um, there was a time in early November, uh, you know, the second week of November 2016, where I thought I would vomit if I heard one more thing about college-educated white suburban women. Uh, when we know that Black women are a very seriously dedicated um, voter group. They are one of the most dedicated voter groups. They turn out in droves. And we just, don't, we just didn't hear that story. I think largely because newsrooms are packed with a lot of highly educated uh, white suburban folks. So I really would love to see us learn that lesson and do better um, in 2016 in analyzing how the vote went and then turning to what these issues mean in the lives of people rather than just in the outcome of an election. That's Kathleen Barton Culver the James Burgess Chair in Journalism Ethics and Director of the University of Wisconsin-Madison's Center for Journalism Ethics. She joined me along with Melody McCurtis, the Deputy Director of Priorities and an organizer for Metcalf Park Community Bridges. A reminder, if you want to see the rest of the short film that we showed you an excerpt from earlier, go to the Intercept website, and I urge you, uh, to go to the Economic Hardship Reporting Project's website as well for more content. And that is a very simple address, economichardship.org. I was also joined by Dan Kaufman, author of The Fall of Wisconsin and a reporter for The New Yorker. Great to talk to you all. Uh, good luck Great in this coming week in all your various uh, ways and walks in life. And good to talk to you all. And I hope all of you who joined us uh, during this Zoom conference, got some ideas, got some insights, uh, got some things that you can bring to uh, your media diet, your media consumption habits, and also maybe um, an extra lens of analysis that you bring to the coverage that you do read and see in the coming weeks. I'm Ray Suarez with the Economic Hardship Reporting Project and the co-host of World Affairs, on public radio and KQED-FM. Great to talk to you all. And um, let's have a great election. And it'll be great for democracy and good for the country. Take care, all. Bye-bye.